Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're working through many lectures that relate to the instrumentation surrounding gas chromatographs. And what we're doing in this first one is talking about kind of the first system in the instrument, which is getting the sample into the mobile phase running gas. And that really incorporates a lot of issues about sample injection, as well as the gases that we use in gas chroma chromatography. So what you see here are actually syringes that you might use to inject a sample into a gas chromatograph. And what you can perhaps see is that they're incredibly small. So with many of the modern columns that we use in GC, capillary columns to be precise, you really don't want a lot of material loaded on, as you'll see later, because you'll overload the column and get those funny peak shapes. So one of the challenges is to actually deliver extremely small volumes of analyte into a GC. And it's actually pretty hard to measure below about 10 microliters. So that's one of the issues that leads to the, some of the new design construction for injection systems. But in these particular syringes, it's just not your everyday syringe. They have to be glass so you can clean them well because you don't want any impurities. And in particular, they need to be gas tight. So they're gas tight syringes, so you don't have any impurities from just whatever's in your lab. So, so here's some diagrams of the injection process. And really what you're gonna do is you don't want too large of sample to enter the column. So I want you to really focus over here on the right. This is what's called a split or a splitless injector. And what you're gonna do is there's almost always a rubber septum that sort of keeps the sample chamber separated from air. And so you've gotta pierce that chamber, that, that septum, with your needle, and that actually can lead to a little bit of rubber coming into the column, so sometimes you'll see impurity peaks due to that, so keep that in mind. And then you're going to inject your sample. Now, you can inject a direct liquid into this area, but it's going to be a heated metal block there, and that block might be as high as 250 or 220 degrees. And what that's going to do is very rapidly heat. It's kind of like putting a steak into a really hot frying pan. <laughs> You're going to get a lot, of, a lot of chemical reactions right away. So if your sample has any impurities or non-volatiles, they're not going to just turn into gas, right? They're going to turn into black junk and stick onto your block. So one of the things to think about when you're using a GC, direct liquid injection is not a good thing to do because you get all kinds of basically junk, non-volatile junk that can really mess up your sample injection. If you've got a really pure hydrocarbon sample, you might be able to get away with it. But it's one of the reasons that people think twice about how to do injections into GCs. So the other thing I want to point out, so there's a, there's a temperature that you can set for the injection system. And as I said, that can vary from method to method, depending on the boiling point of the amylates you're most interested in. The other thing that this diagram sort of indicates is something called splitless injection or split injection. And in a split injection, you might be injecting 50 microliters, but the system is only opening up for a portion of that time to take, let's say, 1 50th of what you injected. So a split injection, you'll see it as 1 to 10 or 1 to 50, which means that you might have injected 10 microliters, but only took a fraction of that by manipulating through valves how much of the gas from the sample chamber got introduced into the mobile phase. So that's an important terminology. I expect you to know the difference between split and splitless injection. And as I said, the reason that split injectors have become pretty much standard on GCs is the advent of these capillary columns that are so small, you can't really load a lot of material into them. One of the things that happens then in these sample introduction chambers is the potential for thermal decomposition. Now we talked about that in terms of just forming black junk, but in this case, I just wanted to show you, and there will be some, some reading material for you to look at. A really common thing is that you don't get black junk, but you actually end up thermally degrading or changing the molecules you might be interested in. So in this case over here, they were doing pesticide analysis, and what they discovered um, in those kinds of broad blobby peaks was the fact that some of their pesticides were actually therm thermally degrading and as a result giving rise to kind of a broad mass of peaks that they hadn't expected. And it also messed up their quantitative analysis quite a bit. And the one example over here, they actually saw entirely new kinds of molecular peaks that were fairly well resolved that were actually deg degradation products of the molecules they were interested in. So what they had to do is do something called a cold on-column injection so thermal decomposition is a really common issue that you face in gas chromatography, particularly if you have fairly complicated sample matrices or reactive analytes that when they're subjected to high temperatures may actually decompose in somewhat predictable ways. 
let's talk a little bit about ways that you have of preparing samples for gas chromatography. One of the really common things to do that I don't have time to talk about in these lectures is the derivatization of things to make them volatile. That's a really important thing to do. So derivatization allows you to take non-volatile species and by, for example, silating them, creating a material that actually has an appreciable vapor pressure, and then analyzing that. So we're not going to talk about that particular sample prep, but I am going to just mention a little bit about headspace analysis, partly because it's very easy and a really clean way to get stuff into a GC that doesn't junk up either your sample introduction system or your column. So what you do is you have to realize that you're going to cap a sample, and rather than directing liquid into the gas chromatograph, you're going to inject the vapor that exists above the sample or the headspace above the sample. And as you can see in this diagram, in any system, particularly if you add some salt to the solution, you're going to be driving out volatiles into the surrounding air right or surrounding gas right above the liquid. And so if you take a sample of just that headspace with the gas tight syringe, and this cap here has a septum in it, you actually get a gas sample without having to use a heated block. And so then you inject that vapor. Now the downside is you have a lot lower concentration because you're injecting a gaseous sample, not a pure liquid. But on the other hand, you get around all the problems that you might face from non-volatile impurities. And it's just a super, super easy way to do G. The other thing you can do, and that's shown over here, is the exact same thing. So you can use what's called a SPEMI headspace. SPEMI, and you'll write this down, is solid phase microextraction. It's a needle that you inject in to extract the gas, except that needle, as you can see here, has basically a sponge coated onto it. It's a porous silica sponge and it absorbs a lot of gas molecules, more, of course, than just if you sucked up the gas alone. And so as the gas sort of seeps into that silica, you get a much, much higher concentration of the analytes that might be present in the headspace. So a SPEMI headspace sampling uses this porous needle or this porous coating over the needle to increase the amount of gas that you sample. And then that just fits directly into the GC injection port where it gets heated and then whatever's stuck to the silicone then volatilizes. A more fancy way is to do something called dynamic headspace sampling, in which you actually have a much, much thicker adsorbent. So here you can see a whole plug of adsorbent. You actually flow a gas over your sample for some amount of time, and that adsorbent gets saturated with that gas. So you really, really load it up. So this is like if you, if you are worried you won't be able to get enough signal, you do dynamic headspace. And then when you're done, after you've loaded everything up, you usually put it into a, a heater of some sort and control the temperature and then get out whatever's stuck to that porous silica chalk. And that gives you even better detection limits. So the downside of sampling with these gas phase techniques is that you just don't end up with a lot of analyte. And so by using either solid phase microextraction, which is just the coated fiber, or by doing this more complicated dynamic headspace sampling, you can get really much more sensitivity as to what are the volatiles that are present above a sample. So a kind of cool example I found was one from Gerstel, a commercial company that makes some of these systems. And for some reason, they decided to analyze instant coffee. <laughs> so I can't tell you what all the peaks are. But what you can see is the bottom is just straight up headspace. They just injected a needle. They took some sample, probably 10 or 50 microliters, and they put it into a column, and they got nothing. So they didn't see any gas phase molecules present. In the middle, they used one of those coated spemi fibers. So they got a lot more literal surface area for the gas to absorb to. And so when they injected it, you start to see some peaks because you're actually picking up the volatile aromatics that are present above instant coffee. And then in the dynamic headspace sampling where you flow gas over the solid material or the liquid for some time, and then you trap what comes off in the much larger, thicker, um, adsorbent material, you can see even more different kinds of compounds present. And so each of these techniques allows you to sort of ratchet up how sensitive you want to be. So if you just do straight headspace sampling, you're really only going to see the most dominant and concentrated volatiles present above a sample. SPEMI lets you get a lot more sensitivity, and dynamic headspace, of course, gives you the most. The final point I want to make about the sort of injection system and the gas system is really to talk about the gases. There's not a lot to say. It's a relatively, it, it's simple to see on paper, but if you ever operate a gas chromatograph, you're actually spending a lot of time handling gases and dealing with the gas, gas uh, 
system. Uh, and what you're going to have are tanks that get delivered by a company that you know are large and they contain compressed gas of the type you want. It's super important that that be ultra pure. The columns these days are going to last longer. You're going to get better and cleaner separations if that gas doesn't have any other gases in it. So one of the big expenses of operating a GC is that you go through those cylinders quite rapidly, especially if you're running a lot. And so that can actually increase your cost, particularly for using something expensive like helium, which usually you are. Um, the pressures of the gases in a GC really range from about 10 to 50 PSI. To kind of calibrate you, if you've ever gone and, and sort of pumped up your tire at a gas station with one of those things that you, you sort of push in and you get some air out of it, that's a standard pressure for compressed air, which will range, but it'll be on the order of, let's say, 20 to 30 PSI. So that's a pretty high pressure that's running through your system. Remember that the diameters, especially those capillary columns, are really small. And so there's a lot of pressure drop that you sometimes have to apply to get the gases to move at the rates you want. I'm not going to be asking you to do the conversions here between pressure and the linear flow rate, but I give you some hints if you're curious about if you know the PSI and you know the column diameters, you can actually calculate the flow rates pretty easily. So with that, I've taken you through the injection system in a GC, a little bit about headspace sampling, and then finally some comments about the gases that are used.